Welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church for Sunday morning worship. We welcome to breakfast. I hope you know that it's been good. We we'll definitely want to thank our gentlemen and a few women who helped us out this morning uh, with the cooking and the teeth and so on. Uh, but we are very thankful for them and their willingness to serve. Uh, this was not the uh, end of eating. If you're still eating, continue eating. If you want something more to drink, go get you something more to drink. Uh, you are definitely welcome to do that. Uh, a couple of announcements to mention uh, as we are gathering. One is that on Tuesday, July the 2nd, on Tuesday, we will uh, be having a meal here at the Family Life Center at noon. And so uh, I was told there will be lots of food, just like there was this morning. And so do come Tuesday morning, or Tuesday rather, at noon, uh, here at the Family Life Center. And that will be Tuesday at noon at the Family Life Center. Other than that, uh, we are also going to have Christmas in July very soon. That'll be the second Sunday of July. Uh, we're looking forward to that. That'll be up in the sanctuary for worship. Other than that, are there any other announcements we need to highlight at this time? If not, our call to worship is printed in our order of worship.
We doing okay? You can sit there if you want. How are we doing? Good. 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 Did you eat something good? Yeah. Yeah. Fourth of July on Thursday. Excited about that? Yeah. Going to the beach. Going to the beach. Nice. Yeah, we're going to All right. Going to some family's house. Good. Anybody doing fireworks? Probably. Probably. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I hope we're careful with those, right? We we'll be careful with those. Well, good. Well, I thought I'd ask you this. Have you ever learned something that was hard to learn? Yeah. What was that? Times. Times tables? Yeah, multiplication. You are right about that. Any amens in the room? <laughs> Math? Hard? Yeah? Okay. Some amens behind you, Melinda. You're not the only one. That's a great example. What else do we think? What's something hard that we've learned how to do? Was tying your shoes hard to learn? Yeah, I remember it being a little hard. I had to take a few tries, right? You might not know this about me, but I know how to juggle. It's one of the coolest things I know how to do. Maybe the only cool thing I know how to do. But that took some practice. I wasn't able to do it on the first try. There are some things that we learn, and the only way that we don't learn them is that we quit, right? Things like tying our shoes, that's a matter of practice. It's a matter of trying again and again, even when we fail, right? And that's a lot of what's happening in the passage that we're going to talk about. Jesus uh, arrives on the shore of a beach, and quickly a man comes to him, and he wants him to heal his daughter. His daughter is sick. Jesus hadn't had time to, to even get on shore yet, hadn't packed, unpacked his suitcase, hadn't checked into his hotel room or anything. Hotel. I know. I know. it. So he's, you know, in a rush. And if I was in a rush, right, that would already be a reason to quit, wouldn't it? Tired, maybe want to take a break. But Jesus keeps going. And then as he's heading towards this daughter who is sick, a woman reaches out and touches his cloak. This woman was also sick, and, and she receives some healing. Something that's happening, though, is that there's a crowd pressing in on Jesus, right? Could you imagine moving through a big crowd with a lot of people pressing in on you? Probably another reason to quit or give up, but Jesus keeps going. This woman who's touched his clothes, the disciples say to Jesus, how can you know somebody touched your clothes? Look at all these people pressing in on you. Even the disciples are telling Jesus, let's go, let's go, let's move along. But Jesus stops, he speaks to her, he calls her daughter, tells her that her faith has made her well. And Jesus kept going. In the midst of all of this, the young lady, the girl who he was heading to heal, she dies. Right? Very sad. And at that point, we would think, you know, maybe Jesus would turn around and that just be the end of it. In fact, that's what they tell her dad. They say, don't bother the teacher any longer. This is, it's too late. But what do you think Jesus does? He keeps going, right? He keeps going. And so he heads to the daughter and raises her from the dead. He keeps going. And I think what I would want us to hear as it relates to keeping on going is, one, Jesus keeps on going with us. We give Jesus a lot of reasons sometimes to quit on us, but Jesus doesn't. He keeps on going. We learn something new. We finally get something right, and then we quickly follow that up with maybe some things that aren't so good, giving Jesus lots of reasons to give up on us. But what does Jesus do? He keeps on going. And likewise for us, there's always lots of reasons to quit, right? We could probably think of all the things that we're doing right now in our lives, whether it be school or a hobby that we keep or something that we're trying to learn or a sport we play, there could be lots of reasons to quit. Tired, it's taking up a lot of time, it's not going well, it's not working out. But what could we maybe learn from Jesus here? Not to quit. To not quit, to keep on going, right? And that can be true at church, right? Lots of reasons sometimes. It's a lot of need in the world. And it can feel like maybe we're not making a big difference. And that reality can feel like maybe it's just good to go ahead and give up. But what would Jesus have us to do? Keep on going. He'd have us keep on going, Emily. And I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> well, good. Well, I hope we can remember that today, okay? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for these, your children. Lord, as they keep on going this summer, Lord, following you and seeking to live out their faith, Lord, we pray your blessing upon them, be with them as they learn and grow this summer, and pray, Lord, now that you would bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
lifting up praises and petitions. Uh, a few that I have brought with me. Uh, one is uh, Janet Pat has asked us uh, to be in prayer for Joe, Janet's husband. He's having his other cataract surgery this week. Uh, so we want to be in prayer for Joe Pat as he prepares to do that. Uh, I went and got to uh, see Brynja again this week, and she continues to recover from the Children's Hospital in Augusta. So I just wanted to bring her name back to you once more for continued prayers for Brynja Horn and all of their family as she continues to recover from that surgery. Also want to be in prayer for uh, Mr. Walker Bettas. Uh, he spent some time in the hospital this week, uh, but is back home and, and doing a whole lot better. I was able to see him as well. Uh, and he is, is doing good. He, I think, wanted to be here today, but maybe he thought I'd rather see him next Sunday and the Sunday after and the Sunday after. And so uh, he's going to take today off and get some rest, but do be praying for uh, Mr. Walker and, uh, and all of their family too this time. Uh, and then as well, I wanted to mention on the on behalf of Neil Richardson, also want to mention, uh, because I, I originally thought this was a July type of announcement, but there are five Sundays in June. Did you know that? And so that means there's an extra Sunday this morning, which means the milestone that I wanted to share with you next week has actually been achieved today. This is now, St. Paul is now my longest appointment by one week. share that with you because now every week henceforth will beat my new record so every Sunday will clap for me right? as we celebrate my continuing record I know Sabrina is very happy about this too that was part of what we hoped for when we came to St. Paul was that uh, we would be here uh, a little longer and, and so uh, this is the joy to share that with you I, that's why I was waiting a lot of times we tell you a lot earlier than now that I'm not moving but I, I didn't want to jinx it one <laughs> and two I actually wanted to earn it first but I do appreciate you uh, for letting me share that with you. It is a joy. We appreciate you. Are there others that we would like to lift up at this time? Yes, sir. Yes. Services at 12 o'clock? Yeah, at school. Yeah. At school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay, very good. So we're lifting up the family of Warren Butler as well as Rodney. Yes, Mr. Bob. Family of Kathleen Long. The family of Kathleen Long. <coughs> Thank you. Others this morning. If not, let us then go to the Lord in prayer. things that we are working on, the things that you have called us to do and to be, Lord, 
joyous seasons like summer. Lord, remind us of the difficulty of enduring. And Lord, we pray that we would, like your son, keep on going, that we would follow in his footsteps and persist, especially in those things that you have called us to do and to be, that we would not grow tired, but that, Lord, we would be strengthened by the power of your Holy Spirit to be your church. And as we do celebrate another year of continued ministry, Lord, as we do that, we also call upon you those people, those names, your children, that you love so dearly. Those like Job, and Brenya, Walker, and Neil. Lord, for Rodney, we lift up and give thanks. We know, God, that you are at work in their lives, supplying for their every need. When it's hard to feel that, to see it, to sense it, us be a part of pointing out your presence in the lives of those who need it, and help us bear that presence in the way that we share our gifts, our talents, our time, our resources with your children, and ultimately with you. Lord, on the week of the 4th of July, we do lift up our military people, those who serve, those who have served. Lord, we pray your special blessing upon them, their protection, they might return home safely to their families that love them. Lord, we also lift up the family of, of Warren Butler, as well as the family of Kathleen Wong. Lord, for all those this morning that hold in their hearts, those who they love to see them more, we call upon your spirit to provide peace and comfort. Lord, we know that you are with them. We know the ways that you have been with us in our own losses. Help us hold hope. for that opportunity that your son Jesus provides. And now we do join together in one voice, praying the prayer that you have taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we'll have our presentation of God's signs and our offers.
again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, from him Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say he touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion of people wailing and weeping loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them not that no one should know this and told them to give her something. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. If there's something strange in your neighborhood, if there's something weird and it doesn't look good, who are you going to call, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Not one, yeah. 
somebody to go on a really long road trip with them who will sit in silence peacefully. They will call my younger brother. You ever thought about who you would call if a great moment of need happened in your life? Maybe a fun game you can play on the way home that won't cause a fight in the slightest. But to answer the question, who would you call if a million dollars was on the line? But the only way you're getting it is if the person you call answers on who would you call? Who would you call? I think most all of us have a go-to person that we list as our emergency contact when we're asked to provide one. Mine is obviously Sabrina, uh, my wife. I put her down because I believe that she would come if I needed her. She would act in my best interest if I was not able to advocate for myself. I list her because I believe that if something happened to me, she would care and thus respond, right? Signed up. But if I'm being honest, right, she, uh, I, I, I think I might have to think of somebody else to call if I ever had to make that one phone call you get that I've seen people in the movies make when they're in trouble with the law. You know that one phone call? Might have to call somebody else. I'm not so sure if her first question would be, what did you do instead of how can I help? I think she would eventually come to get me, but it might take her a while to find her keys, to get ready, to find where I'm at, to ultimately come to my aid. Have you ever thought of the question, who would you call if you found yourself in a moment that you could no longer help yourself? Said differently, who is your emergency contact, right? Picking up on a theme from last week's passage of the disciples in the boat with Jesus as a storm sought to destroy their boat, this week's passage carries a similar tone of desperation on the part of the synagogue leader and the hemorrhaging woman. Last week, the disciples, out of desperation, appealed to Jesus to keep the storm from destroying their boat. This week, a father, out of desperation, appeals to Jesus to save his dying daughter. This week, a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years reaches out in desperation to be healed. If you are like me, desperation is not a word that I commonly have thought of with the word faith, desperation, faith. Yet, Jesus stills the storm. He heals the hemorrhaging woman. He raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. It's an interesting thing to consider the kind of faith that's on display here, a kind of faith that leads Jesus to saying, your faith has made you well. It isn't a steadfast faith that has looked like calm assurance that all is going to be fine. It hasn't been a blind faith that those in need, once they receive their healing, say, see, I told you there was nothing to worry about. It isn't a practice of faith where those in the passage refer to Jesus by, Jesus by titles like Lord, Messiah, Christ. If I had to assign a word to the kind of faith that is on display here, that word would be desperate. The disciples, Jairus, the hemorrhaging woman, their faith is a desperate one. The desperation in this passage can almost be felt coming off of the pages. There's desperation in a father's voice as he begs Jesus to heal his dying daughter. Jairus pleads, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay hands on her so that she may be made well and live. There is desperation in a woman's voice that can be heard so clearly, especially in light of Mark's narration of her circumstances. Mark says she had endured much under many positions and had spent all that she had. She was no better rather grew worse. Out of the desperation she has known for 12 years, she says from that deepest place of hope, if I touch his clothes, I'll be made well. The father's desperation turns to hopelessness as Jesus spends time with the woman whose faithful touch enabled uh, the healing that she needed. 
Mark doesn't come out and say it. Maybe you can hear it in the story, the way it's written. But certainly Mark seems to imply that Jesus has paused to talk to the woman, lost them the critical moment that they needed to get to Jairus' daughter in time to save her from dying. Two painfully desperate situations that maybe we can relate to, both in terms of being the one in a desperate situation. Has that ever been you? And then likewise, like Jesus, where so much is happening at once that because you can't be in two places at once, the ball inevitably gets dropped. There's a strange connection between faithfulness and desperation that's getting highlighted in the passage. It's desperation, as we've said, that leads a father and a suffering woman to see Jesus and believe that something more would be possible when, by all appearances, there should be. After the scene where Jesus speaks to the formerly hemorrhaging woman, Jairus is informed of his daughter's death. The words that get spoken to him almost sound like an appeal for his desperation, his hope to end, stop. A similar appeal that the hemorrhaging woman may have heard a few times in her life. You're wasting your money. There's nothing more that can be done. Jairus is told your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? These sound like invitations for desperation to just turn into defeat. And that's when Jesus interrupts what is being told to Jairus and simply says to him, do not fear, only believe. It always feels very on the nose for me when I stand in a spot like this before the body of believers as a pastor and encourage us to pray. That always feels very on the nose. It feels like the most obvious thing I can say. It feels like the most obvious thing that those who come to worship anticipate hearing. In moments like this, I feel like a real estate agent telling you there's never been a better time to buy a house. Yet, with our own moments of desperation on our minds, tombs of people and situations that have no foreseeable reason to hope, hear the words that Jesus offered to Jairus. Do not fear. He says only believe. I think those words are a calling to protest against death itself. A reminder to death that as powerful as it is, as powerful as it appears, there's another who I not only put my faith in, but my desperation in, whose presence among us means hope lives. Prayer, then, is one of those places that we can live out what it means to stand at a tomb filled with our enemies and believe something more to be possible, even when our eyes can't see that. Prayer, especially a desperate one, to the God who has come to our shore bearing the good news that even if it's been 12 years and the problem has only worsened, even if the help came too late or not at all, that we do not have to fear, we do not have to despair, that we simply believe in the one who makes a way where there otherwise wouldn't be a way. We make our one phone call. We call our emergency contact with the confidence that he will show up for us. It's a really vulnerable thing to consider, one's emergency contact, one's last line of defense, our one phone call. I remember when uh, one of the most serious conversations my mom ever had with me, I had just received my driver's license, after passing that test, my world all of a sudden got a whole lot bigger. In this conversation, I, I heard my mother's words to me not as a command, but as a desperate plea to her son. She said, I want you to know that no matter where you are or what you have done, I will always come get you, no matter what. I remember feeling very loved by those words. I remember feeling safe by those words. I have remembered them all these years. Thankfully, I never had to take her up on that promise, but I believe that the promise she was making through those words still holds true, even to this day. When my friend Alan died last year, I remember making the joke at his funeral that part of what I was grieving was that 
the one person in my life who, even if I committed a crime and went to prison, he was going to be proud of me no matter what. <laughs> what I have been selfishly grieving has been that my emergency contact list decreased by one, one very special person in my life who I knew without a shadow of a doubt would show up for me on my lowest and my worst day. Desperation is not an emotion we thankfully experience every day. That would be awful. But when we do, what keeps that desperation from turning into despair or hopelessness is that emergency contact list. Those people in our lives that even if the best they can do for a situation is simply be there to go through it alongside us, their presence provides a level of healing that might not stop the bleeding and it might not bring back somebody from the dead. But it enables that desperation to endure. By their presence, we are strengthened to not fear, to believe. It's important to not speak in metaphor here. Two healings happen in this passage that are miraculous. They are proof of God's faithfulness. They serve the purpose of enabling us to see a reason to not let our most desperate prayers ever stop. But to keep knocking on that door to keep meeting Jesus at the shore, to keep reaching out in desperate faith for Jesus to do and be for us what only Jesus can. With that said, I don't want to sound blind to the reality of this lifetime. Sometimes the bleeding doesn't get healed in this lifetime. Sometimes the healing happens on the other side of death, and not on the side that we desperately hoped for, prayed for, pleaded for. What I want to be clear on here is that this passage isn't telling us that we just haven't been desperate enough. That we just haven't been faithful enough. Prayer isn't a transaction. It's a connection to the one who tells us even when our prayer seems to go unanswered, even when the report we are given makes us think there's no more sense in troubling the teacher any further, Jesus tells us do not fear. He says only believe. Do one of the hardest things faith asks us to do, which is believe in victory, even when surrounded by nothing but the ashes of defeat. When we follow in the way of Jesus, we learn how to see crosses not just as endings, but as the very place God does God's best work. If it's even a cross that lies ahead and we can't pray our way around it, even so, Jesus tells us, do not fear. He says, only no doubt that you can surmise where this sermon was heading, so I'm just going to say it in the plainest way I can. Your emergency contact list is never empty. It's never empty. It might increase and decrease as the years go by, but it never falls below one. There is always another who we can call out to who won't let us go through the most desperate of situations alone. There is another who has the power to affect the change, the healing that is needed in any situation. It is my conviction that it is worth praying for that healing, both when it's needed and when it didn't come in the way that was hoped for. It is my conviction that this passage bears witness to the truth that even if it's been 12 years and it's only gotten worse, even if the healing doesn't come when it was needed, that we don't have to fear, that we can't simply believe the good news this morning is that with a person like Jesus on our emergency contact list, we know who to call on when our desperation starts turning into despair, when our hope is turning into hopelessness, when we stand on the outside of that tomb and our believing deaths lie, but it gets the last word. I'll finish with a quote. In one of my all-time favorite comedy movies, Dumb and Dumber, one of the main characters, Lloyd Christmas, one of the best character names ever, Lloyd Christmas, a chipped tooth limousine driver, falls in love with a woman who's named Mary. He meets her when she rides in his limo, and without getting into more plot than is necessary, Lloyd eventually asks Mary outright, what do you think the chances are of a guy like you, or a guy like me and a girl like you ending up Mary eventually responds to Lloyd's question of what are my chances with, not good. 
Lloyd says, you mean not good like one out of a hundred? And Mary responds with, I'd say more like one out of a million. The quote I want to end on is probably the most famous quote from the entire movie, Lloyd Christmas Years. His chances of ending up with Mary as being that of one out of a million. And he says, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> saying that the good news of the passage gives us a million reasons to continue to pray with Jesus on our emergency contact list. We, like Lloyd, can say with confidence that we have a reason to hope. So you're telling me there's a chance. I would say that there isn't only a chance, but an assurance that we always have a reason to keep praying, a reason to keep hoping, a reason to keep pleading with God. Jesus says to us as we stand facing what seems like a story that has reached its ending, do not fear, only believe. Like Lloyd, we can recklessly, foolishly declare that there's always a reason to hope. With Jesus on our emergency contact list, we can stand at tunes with hope because we know that God gives the last word. to the rocks for precious Lord to take my hand in this hymn 474.